It's amazing to me and has been all my life since I've tried to study the scriptures of how those things that are so profound can be set out in such simple ways because God loves us and wants to speak on our level of understanding. Thus, the Bible is revealed accommodates man. And we're able to understand it on those matters that pertain to our salvation, if we would but desire it. Today, our lesson will have to do with matters in the Old Testament, reminding everyone, as Paul said, that these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope, Romans 15, 4. Now, Moses' inspired account of Noah and the ark is one of the most familiar in all of the Bible. Children learn it at an early age, and they usually love it. It sticks with them throughout their childhood into their manhood or womanhood. But it is also a, an account that has great insight into the nature and character of God. And we get that insight as we look at God's dealings with Noah. There may be other things, but I want you to notice these that are revealed in his dealings with the great patriarch. There are four eternal principles of God. Principles by which God deals with all men in every generation. In other words, they're not limited to his dealing with Noah. Now, of course, the account of Noah and the ark is found in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1 and going all the way through chapter 9 and verse 22. We learn that the people were so evil that the imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was on evil continually, only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man from the face of the earth, chapter 6, 5, and 7. Now, again, I pointed out a few remarks ago in the beginning that the Bible accommodates man as God made man. Now, God doesn't engage in grieving as a mortal would. He doesn't have human characteristics. Yet, it lets us know that God's disposition toward those who sin is completely different from those who love Him and keep His commandments. Now remember, Noah found favor, grace with God. And therefore, we see God determining to save Noah from the upcoming great worldwide flood. God then gave him directions that if he followed those directions, which involved, of course, ultimately building an ark, that he would be saved. He had to build it out of gopher wood, and it makes no difference whether we know what gopher wood was or not. Noah did. So he specified the wood. Now, pitch is natural asphalt, and he used that to pitch it within and without in order to seal it. And then it was 300 cubits long. It was 50 cubits wide and it was 30 cubits tall. It had one window, one door, and three floors. And the promise was given that when Noah did what God told him, he would be saved. Now when you look over here and the New Testament's great hall of fame of great and faithful Old Testament worthies. You find in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, 
prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Thus this Old Testament account is lifted by the inspired writer and used to exhort people to continue faithful to God. Because no one never knew what we know in the gospel system of the New Testament teaching today. Yet he was totally faithful to what God told him to do. Notice by faith he acted. Well, faith comes with hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Thus he acted on the basis of what God told him to do. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And his attitude toward God was that he had the proper respect. He feared God. Something the world around about us just doesn't understand. I think some brethren today, and I know a great many people that are not, who would say, you mean he had to get that 300 cubits just exactly right? He couldn't go, as we would say today, just an inch over or an inch under? Yes, he had to get it just exactly right. What about the 50 feet long or cubits long and 30 cubits high? Couldn't he have built two windows? Couldn't he have had at least two doors? Three floors, four floors, five? What difference does it make? It's an ark. If it floats, it's fine. Sad part about it is it's by faith that Noah did this. Thus, at the direction of God, he kept specifically what God said. Or it would not have been by faith. His faith came from hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And thus he serves, along with these others in chapter 11 of Hebrews, as a great pattern for us in our attitude toward the gospel system, toward the New Testament teaching, and how to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15. And that God means what he says, and he says what he means, and we can do it, really it comes down to this, if we want to. Now the first thing I want us to notice now that we have that brief bit that you probably already knew before us, is that man's sins continue to grieve God. Genesis 1 27, Moses tells us that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Man perverts God's way of doing things. It wasn't long before he transgressed God's law in the garden. And you can be sure that what is said in general in Noah's time of sinful people grieving God, that that grieved God. So we need to understand that the nature of God is to hate sin. Anybody that tries to tell you that God doesn't hate sin, ignore it, oppose it, correct it. We sometimes pass lightly over sins. That's us. We're humans. We like to do things like that. We like to categorize them and say these are far worse than others. And we're saying really that God just doesn't think those things are that important. Well, did he think 300 cubic arc was important? One window was important. One door was important. Three floors in the ark, were they important? Certainly, he expects to be believed and obeyed. And here's a simple, simple account that tells us that God means what he says and says what he means, and he has a change in the New Testament. What God looked down on, when God looked down on the world, I should say, when God looked down on the world, he saw what before the flood? That the earth was filled with violence. All flesh corrupted his way on the earth. Wickedness was great in the earth, Genesis 6, 5, and verses 11 through 12. That grieved God. Do you think God's grieved today? When we look at the world all around us, do we not see the same thing? Thus God, who does not change would, be, would still be grieved. Now, we who are members of his church, we've heard the gospel. We've obeyed it. We've been added to the church. We're Christians and all that the Bible teaches that to be. Should it not grieve us too if we have the mind of Christ as we're taught to have? To have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of God. 
and the wickedness, wherever it is, that which is against God and contrary to his will, should grieve every one of us. When Adam and Eve sinned in Eden, Genesis 3, 22 through 24, makes it clear that God drove them out of the garden, lest in their sinful state they continue to eat of the tree of life and live forever. God will not abide sin or where it is. He won't let sin to be just practiced and no consequences. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, the prophet said, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Well, what's going to keep me from being acceptable to God, from God hearing me, from God answering my prayers? Just let me see sin in my life and I do nothing about it. And he will not hear me. Why does God turn his ear away when we sin? There's only one answer to that. He hates sin. The psalmist also wrote, Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. That's a good major premise for syllogism. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Peter is a worker of iniquity. Therefore, God hates him. That's as simple as it can be. Psalm 45, 7, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. And in Psalm 119, verse 128, I hate every false way. The wickedness, as we go into another situation in the Old Testament of Sodom, also grieves God and his love for sinners while hating their sins caused him to agree with Abraham that he would spare that city if even ten, and we might say if only ten, righteous souls could be found. But the divine record, Genesis chapters 18 and 19, says they could not be found. That may tell us something about what goes on in the mind of God concerning when he decides to bring punishment on things. In this case, ten godly people could not be found, and so he destroyed them. The fire that fell to consume Sodom paints a very vivid picture of God's great hatred of sin. And in the New Testament, the Apostle John writes, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. 1 John 1, 5 and 6. Well, for his creatures to walk in darkness, the darkness of sin, the guilt of sin grieves God as it did in the Old Testament in Noah's day. It would do good for us as we strive to seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto us, Matthew 6, They would realize there's not a day goes by that God is not pictured at grieving at the sins of men. Next point is that God's patience is limited. I use the word patience here like we normally do, having to put up with things. Remember in the, old, in the New Testament, patience has the idea of bearing up under the burden but never stopping being faithful. So did you ever wonder how long it took Noah to build the ark? Possibly 100 years, Genesis 5:32, chapter 7. In verse 11. Now that's a big project. But I wonder what he was doing besides building an ark. 
Well, if I look at the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says of Noah that he wasn't just a builder of the ark, that he was a preacher of righteousness. Now, some of us don't think you can really be a gospel preacher, a preacher of the word, a preacher of righteousness, unless that's all that you do. Take, for example, Jude 3. Contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Automatically, in our minds, we think that's the preacher's job. Our select few. Well, Jude wasn't just written to preachers, was it? That's saying that's the job of every single solitary Christian to the best of their ability is to stand up for the truth of the Bible. So while the ark was being prepared, <clears throat> so Peter tells us, the Spirit of Christ preached through Noah to that rebellious generation. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. Now the interesting thing about all of that that some people just can't seem to get in their mind and that is that God did not immediately destroy those who sinned. He gave them ample time, and in that time, ample warning to repent of their sins and return to Him. And if you look at the account of Sodom and Gomorrah and their destruction and why He destroyed them, He did the same with the wicked city of Sodom, Genesis chapter 19. I can only conclude then that He's doing the same today in this world since every day is filled with violence and wickedness of every description and God's grieved at it, then why doesn't he just come on and end the whole thing? Because that he will do someday. And it must be because not only does he hate iniquity in those who commit it, but he also loves them and doesn't want them to lose their soul on devil's hell. We must understand, though, that God's patience is limited. He is not going to always let wickedness continue. But he will destroy the guilty. Many times in the wilderness wanderings of ancient fleshly Israel, while Moses was leading them in the wilderness, they sinned repeatedly against God. But he kept them, provided for them, led them until finally they went too far. Numbers chapter 13. And when the sentence of judgment or punishment came, notice what's said in Numbers 14, 27 through 31. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? Then he went on, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. Further, your little ones, which you said would be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye despised. And we all know the Old Testament account of why the Israelites wandered 40 years in the wilderness. It's because when they had the opportunity, as God directed them to obey Him and go up and take the land, they wouldn't do it demonstrating their rebelliousness, their stubbornness, their desire to have things done their way, not seeing the importance of complying with God's will. So he said they would all die. And they did. All who were 20 years old and upward that left Egypt, save Joshua and Caleb, died in the wilderness. Now that eternal principle is working today. The reason Christ has not returned to judge the world again is found in a passage that I think is very familiar to most here, certainly to all Bible students, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Concerning the second coming of Christ, Christ said, I'll return. It simply says, the Lord's not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness. But His long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every time we look at a clock or we look at our wristwatch, we see a timepiece somewhere and we see it moving, we ought to think of, that's happening. This day began and it continues because God doesn't want anybody to be lost. And it's only in time and space and a material atmosphere where we can hear the truth and prove we love Him and obey Him by setting aside all the things of this present world and serving God. The Lord is patient. He's long-suffering. 
But one day, that's all going to end. And judgment will take place. It did in Noah's day. It did with Sodom and Gomorrah. There's another principle that comes out of this account of Noah and the flood. God wants people to obey him. See, God's purpose is really unchanging. We're familiar with Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now when you read, uh, when we read in Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, by faith Noah did such and such. He moved with fear. Well, that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes, inspired of the Holy Spirit, told us to do. It's the whole of man to fear God and keep his commandments. That's all we need to be interested in. Nothing else really matters on this earth. When God told Noah that he was bringing a flood upon the earth, now nobody had ever seen anything like that. It didn't rain in those days as we know rain today. And you can imagine the reaction, at least I think we can, of the contemporaries of Noah to whom he preached. They must have scoffed at him. Just like people like that scoff at things from the Bible today. And the existence of God and the deity of Christ, the inspiration of scriptures, or that Jesus is coming again to judge the world, or that the Bible is the book that will be the standard of judgment, John 12, 48. But Noah didn't scoff. And that tells you something about why he found grace in God's sight in the first place. He had always been that kind of person. And he evidently made an impression upon his family. Because not only was Ms. Noah faithful, but also his three sons and their wives. So we read again Hebrews eleven seven By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Well, are we not being warned of God of things not seen as yet? The coming of our Lord. In the end of this world, when the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So he moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Notice that his faith built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition, Romans 10, 17, moved him to act. And he acted out of a proper disposition toward God, moved with fear. <clears throat> God spoke. Noah believed. Therefore, Noah did what God said. It's just that simple. It still is. And there's no use making anything different from it. It's that simple. When we understand God says this is what I ought to do, we don't question Him. We don't try to figure out a way around it. We simply comply with it. Notice the reading in Genesis 6.22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now that's written for our learning. What does that say about the commandments of Christ today and our attitude toward them? So when he said to Noah, make it out of gopher wood, there were no question. It would be like a lot of people say, well, look, I've got to travel all the way over here to get gopher wood. And we've got this kind of wood right here. I don't remember which Hollywood movie it was, but I think it was back in the 60s. I think it was called the Bible. And so many of those things are so embellished and twisted and messed up, they really get away from the text. But this impressed me. The fellow that was, I think it was John Houston, who was playing Noah, <laughs> God speaks and he looks very humble. And he tells them about the ark, its dimensions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I like the way that he presented faithful obedience. As soon as God finished telling him what to do, from that point forward, he began to step off 300 cubic feet or cubits. Now, that's an attitude, I think, that's the way we need to see how we approach God when he approaches us and gives us our directions. So he knew all these particular matters, and his faith demanded that he keep that ark 300 cubits long, no longer, no shorter. The same thing's true when it comes to all the rest of the dimensions of the ark. 
And we see that echoed when Saul, King Saul, had violated the Lord's will in the case of the Amalekites and Agag. That we learn that Samuel echoed the same sentiments of Noah in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. Well, didn't law of Moses require sacrifices? Yes. But that didn't justify anybody saying, well, I made all these sacrifices like the law said, but then I went ahead and did this like I wanted to. It wouldn't make any difference. If we would please God, it must be on His terms. I can't say that enough and emphasize it enough. It must be on His terms and not ours. That means doing what He wants and the way that He wants it for the reason, as I say many times, sometimes there's more than one reason that He wants it. We simply seek to carry out His will. One wood is not as good as another, even as one church is not as good as the one Jesus built, Matthew 16, Acts 2. If we would understand these things in the Old Testament, we'd understand better why Paul said, whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning. Because we can look in Galatians 3.24 and see the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That we might be justified by faith. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth. And we're very familiar with Hebrews 5.9. That he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now did you know that you can... Um, Search the Bible from the beginning to the end of it without finding one blessing for those who are disobedient. It's not there. Then why do we try to tell ourselves I can be disobedient and God will still give me heaven? Every promised blessing is predicated on obedience to God's will from the heart. And thus Jesus asked the people of his day, and he still asks, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46. So the Lord expects us to obey him today as to what is taught in the New Testament concerning salvation, even as he expected Noah to obey him then. When Noah did what God told him, what happened? God took care of him. God's true to his promises. That was the promise that he made and that was the promise that he kept. The faith that God will reward is described in Hebrews 11, 6 through 7. That's why those verses are there. Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Yes, we must believe God is and believe that God rewards them that seek him. Now, question, what was Noah doing in building the ark? Seeking after God. When one today is doing God's will, he's seeking after God. Acts 17, verse 27. And one who refuses to do what he knows God's will is, really doesn't believe in God. Noah was seeking the reward that God had promised, and he definitely knew it could be received only by his humble obedience to whatever was required. So he simply did what God told him to. Paul's here and says, as I said in the beginning, how simple these profound things are that bear upon our salvation. Jesus warns us, enter into this narrow gate. And he says, For narrow is the gate, and straightened is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Why? Look around you. They're interested in this world. They're interested in their own gratification of their own appetites of the flesh. 
They haven't got time to pay any attention to all of this. They simply don't believe. They just don't accept it. Read the Bible to them. I don't like it. I don't care what it says. That's exactly the attitude of a great many people. Later in Matthew, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Look how that applies to Noah and the ark and deliverance from the flood. In all of God's dealings with man, we see this truth. God rewards those who do what he says, who keep his commandments, who act according to the authorized will of heaven. Now that just hasn't changed and it's not going to. So for those who don't obey, Paul made it clear to Christians a long time ago and so to us today in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8. And do you are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some people may argue about whether or not we have to fully obey, but one who believes the Lord simply doesn't question that. He knows that every promised blessing found in the scriptures is based upon man's obedience to God's will. If Noah wants to be saved, it had to be on God's terms. If we're saved, it will be on God's terms. So there are at least four eternal truths that we can learn from the account of Noah the ark and the great flood that God brought on the world to destroy evil people. That is, sin grieves God. That is, long suffering or patience will one day run out. That He wants all men everywhere to obey Him. And that He rewards those who love and obey His commandments. Those things won't change. They didn't change the patriarchal age, they didn't change the mosaical age, and they won't change. Till the end of time. Thus Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, you're outside of Christ. You haven't from the heart obeyed the gospel by believing with all your heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repenting of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confessing your faith in Christ that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, verse 10. And being buried with the Lord in baptism by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. You're lost. If you die now, there's no hope for you. You're not obedient to Him concerning how to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you sin, you have the power, I hope, the humility to repent of sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. If you're therefore subject to the good gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.